Thank you, Tony, and good morning to everybody. We continue our series, Journeying with Jesus, in Luke's Gospel as we turn to Luke chapter 17. Uh, we've moved on a couple of chapters from last week. Chapter 17, and we're going to read from verse 11 to verse 19. Luke 17, verse 11 to 19. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went... They were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. We praise God for his word. Let's pray. <coughs> Father God, once again, we thank you <coughs> for the privilege of opening your word this morning and reading it. We thank you that we can do so freely in a language that we can understand. Father, help us to make this a precious time as we make the most of it. Lord, we remember our brothers and sisters who throughout the world today are suffering and not able to do what we are able to do. Lord, wherever your people are gathered today, or whether they are on their own, we pray that you would encourage them and bless them and speak to them. We pray that they may draw strength through your word, and that you might speak to people through it. Father, we ask this here, that you alone might be glorified and seen, and that we might become more like Jesus. For it's in his name we ask it. Amen. <clears throat> Scottish Minister Alexander White famous 19th century preacher was known for his uplifting prayers in the pulpit. He always found something for which to be grateful. And one Sunday morning the weather was so gloomy that one church member thought to himself, surely the preacher won't think of anything of which to thank the Lord for on this miserable day like this. Much to his surprise, however, White began by praying like this. We thank thee, O God, that it is not always like this. <laughs> on another occasion White was visiting an elderly parishioner who complained about everything and about everyone finally at the end of his visit he stands up he gets his hat and, and he goes to say goodbye and his only comment to her was a phrase which he took from Psalm 103 verse 2 and he said this to her and mind you forget not all his benefits I don't know about you, but the war in Ukraine and the suffering we're hourly seeing on our TV screens has given me a great appreciation for many things. The place we live, the peace we enjoy, the bed we sleep in, the, the, the shower, the, the, the food readily available in the cupboard, the beauty in the simple things in the local park when we walk the dog. But it's not the first time that something like this has happened to me. You see, there are times and circumstances when I co I'm, poor, I'm caused to pause and thank God. But the problem is, it's all too often short-lived. When there's a leak from the bathroom roof into the downstairs toilet, when those famous electricity and gas bills rise, when someone gets ill, when someone we love dies, when the war is going on in Ukraine and there's suffering in Russia and the rest of the world, when the world's in absolute turmoil, our prayers often solely turn to petition prayers. And thankfulness diminishes or becomes non-existent. And before long, we can find ourselves moaning and groaning about everybody and everything. And any thought of thanksgiving is long gone. And yet as Christians, we have got so much to thank God for. And our passage today is a great reminder, not only that we have so much to thank God for, but it reminds us what we can be thankful for and who we should be thankful to. Last week on our journey with Jesus, we were somewhere on a road to Jerusalem. And you remember there was this crowd that was following Jesus and Jesus stops and the people all gathered round him and he says to them about the cost of being a disciple. He says, if you're going to follow me, there's a cost. 
You're going to have to have a cost in your relationships. You're going to have to have a cost, a sacrificial cost, as you take up your cross and follow me. And he says, and before you set out, I want you to weigh up the cost. Don't, don't follow me if you've not weighed it all up first. And then he talked about being salt, and we, we didn't, we say that there were certain aspects of salt that we could be in the world, that we could live like salt as we went out, having counted the cost. Well, this week on our journey with Jesus, we're still on that road to Jerusalem. And as we travel down it today, we're looking at the subject of thankfulness. And as we travel, we're going to be thinking all about what Jesus did and said here in this passage. And in spite of all the problems we face, in spite of all the state of the world, in spite of the cost to us as disciples of following Jesus, we always have so much to thank God for. Now then, Dr. Luke, as we said before, throughout his gospel, points, there are points, signposts, if you like, way markers, that remind us that Jesus is on this journey towards Jerusalem and ultimately to his death on a cross. And this, chapter 17, verse 11, is one such point. The first verse we read, it said, now on his way to Jerusalem. We're reminded once again that Jesus has set out resolutely and that week after week, mile after mile, hour after hour, step after step, He's getting nearer and nearer to the day that he's going to sacrifice his own life for mankind. And today we travel with him as he heads into a village. And we're on the border. Now then, if I say to you border, at the moment it's quite a large part of our vocabulary, isn't it? Our minds are taken to the border of Ukraine. And we picture invading armies coming across it in tanks, uninvited. And we see refugees clamouring to get out of there, across the border anywhere, to get to safety into one of the countries around about it, and then outwards across Europe. But often borders are unremarkable things, aren't they? Sometimes they're just a signpost, or they might be a line, or, or a simple fence. But we're seeing today in Eastern Europe that a line which divides, a border which divides, is not just based on geographical things, but political things as well. But borders also mark cultural and religious divisions, and often lead to separation. As we walk with Jesus today, we're on one such border. There are no bombs, there's no tanks, but as we walk along this border, it's a border which separates people who are divided. This is the border of Samaria, home to the Samaritans, and the Galileans, who exclusively, pretty much, were the Jews. And the people did not get along. They hated each other. It was always simmering underneath. They they really didn't disguise it, the Jews and the Samaritans. They they were enemies. It all started hundreds of years before. It had been exacerbated when the northern kingdoms, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom and the two tribes of the southern kingdoms of Israel had divided and then the Israelites from the northern kingdom, of course, had intermarried with the Assyrians And that over the years, the people of the southern kingdom, the Jews of Judah, had come to consider their sort of distant relatives in the north to be sort of half people, you know, half breeds. And they were now known as Samaritans. And from that point on, the animosity between them grew and grew and the tension grew until they lived different sides of a border and they hated each other. Now, then, I want us to notice in this passage that Dr. Luke tells us that Jesus was going to a village, but he doesn't tell us which one. Why not? simply because it's not important. It's enough to know that we're on the border of a place that causes division. Because this passage, as much as it's about thankfulness, speaks of division and separation. We've already noted the national and religious barriers that have been formed between the Jews and the Samaritans. And then as we journey with Jesus along this border, we notice as we look in our mind's eye, we see there are ten men. And these ten men have got leprosy. And verse 12 tells us that they stood at a distance. Back in week 7, when we looked at Jesus loving the outcast who has also got leprosy, we learned something about the laws covering those who had leprosy or infectious disease. We know that the rabbinical teaching of the day tells us that a leper had to remain 100 cubits, a cubit is about 18 inches or 45.7 centimetres if you're metric, so it's about 50 yards away from people if they were upwind. And four yards, two yards, we're used to two metres, aren't we, from downwind. It was illegal to meet a leper. There were such rigorous rules in place. Leviticus 13 in the Old Testament, verses 45 to 46, sums up what it was like 
to be a leper. This is what it says. Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their faces, a bit like COVID, and cry out, unclean, unclean. And as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Well, it seems that these 10 lepers, these 10 outcasts, in their misery and their illness, have become banded together. But you see, in seeing them keeping their distance from Jesus, we see a second division and another separation in this passage. They were a division sufficient that they had to shout in a loud voice. I suspect they must have been upwind. They were probably 50 yards apart. And these 10 unclean men were separated from all the healthy people, including Jesus. And it's in these divisions and separations that Dr. Luke wants us to see something else. He wants us to see that just as these men were kept from Jesus because they were unclean, so too you and I are kept from Jesus because we're unclean, because of our sin. And this is the biggest problem in the world today, isn't it? You see, it's not the borders of national and political separation that cause division and hatred. The biggest problem in the world today stems from our sin, which has led to us being separated from God. You see, it's easy, isn't it, when we see what's going on in Ukraine to question God or to even blame God. One of the popular questions I get asked at the moment is, how can God allow this to happen? But you see, the problem isn't created by God, is it? It's created by our sin, the sin of mankind, which separates us from God. And these ten outcasts, they come to Jesus and from a distance they shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy, have pity on us. Now these men, they'd heard about Jesus, they even knew his name, and uh, they know that Jesus healed people. They knew, they'd probably seen the miracles themselves. They knew that Jesus could help them. They were in a pitiful state, and they asked Jesus to take pity on them. And they came, and they claimed possibly as close as they were permitted under the law in hope, And they cried out to Jesus. Do you know, this week, you may have heard it yourself, I've heard a number of occasions on the news, reporters and politicians finish interviews with people from Ukraine or Russia or wherever else it happens to be, or even their own correspondents, and they finish the little section by saying, our prayers are with you. Our prayers are with you. Now, I don't know if these people are Christians or whether they've got any faith or whether they've ever prayed before in their life. It's often the case, isn't it, that when trouble comes into our life, suddenly people start praying and turn to God. When they're in a pitiful state, they say something other than themselves. They come as close as they dare to Jesus. And they cry out, Lord, stop the war in Ukraine. Lord, help the refugees. Or perhaps more personally, Lord, heal my illness and restore my health. Or or, Lord, heal the division and restore my broken marriage. People who don't know God suddenly find themselves crying out to him. Picture the scene. Imagine we're there this morning. It's border country. There's a village just down the road. We're about to enter into it. And there's ten lepers who are isolating together just over there. A crowd's gathering nearby because they've heard this shouting going on from this group of leopards. Leopards? Lepers even. As we watch... What it kept you awake, didn't it? What is Jesus going to do? What is Jesus going to do as the hears this shouting? Well, in verse 14, we read four wonderful words. Isn't Dr. Luke great the way he records stuff for us? Because it says this: when he, that is Jesus, when he saw them. Isn't that amazing? You see, these men were invisible to the world. If you were walking down that street and you saw ten lepers, you'd do what a lot of people do today, and they'd look away, they wouldn't want anything to do with them. They're invisible, they don't want to see them. They're a problem beyond which they want to be able to cope with. So they turn away and and they look in a different direction. But here, Jesus saw them. He looked and he saw them. He didn't look away. He didn't overlook them. He didn't run away from them. Friends, as we pitifully cry out to God about Ukraine or about our problems... God doesn't overlook people who cry out to him. He sees them. He sees us. He sees whatever state we find ourselves in. And no matter how much sin is in our life, Jesus sees us and he sees our need. And Jesus responded to the ten lepers. He shouts back to them. He says, go show yourself to the priest. Now then in week seven, we took note, didn't we, of what the priest's involvement was with all of this. 
We also saw how Jesus on that occasion with that leper didn't touch the leper. Sorry, he did touch the leper, yet he didn't have to to heal him. So he did so because he wanted to show that the leper, this man who'd had this disease which would cause him not to feel, he wanted him to feel something of the love and care of Jesus. So he reaches out and he touches him. And we said that was a wonderful thing that Jesus did. But here, Jesus didn't go near them. There's probably 50 yards between them. And he didn't even speak of healing to them. He actually just tells them to go and see the priests. So what was that all about? Was this too difficult a job for Jesus? Was, was he trying to offload the problem to the religious people of the day? Was he not interested? No, no, and no. That's not what was happening. We remember that a priest had the duty of inspecting infectious diseases and excluding from the camp of Israel in the Old Testament anybody who got this disease and putting them outside the camp so to, to stop the spread of infection. And so too the priest had the reverse role. If somebody was healed, got better, well then they would come back to the priest and the priest would say, examine them and they say, yes, you're now healed, you can come back into the camp and be restored to your family and society. Now we know that Jesus didn't say to these guys that he was healing them. And for the ten, they might have had a discussion there and then. I can imagine it, can you? Just listen in for a minute. He said, they might have said to each other, well, what's the point in going to the priest if we're not healed? Because Jesus hadn't healed them at this point. Maybe we'll look foolish. Or, or maybe somebody, one of the groups said, let's just look and uh, go and do and, and see what happens. Or maybe because they knew that Jesus had healed others, that they all decided, right, that's what he told us to do. Off we go, let's go quickly. But whatever happened, in obedience, they did go. They all ten of them went towards the priest. And then it happened. Somewhere along the road, these ten people, these ten lepers, were all healed completely. Bodies restored, disease gone, new life where decay had been evident in their bodies. And one of them, so overjoyed, stops turns and heads back towards Jesus. This man knew that he was healed and he started praising God along that road in a loud voice. He didn't care who knew. He was just so overwhelmed that God had healed him and he was heading back to Jesus and he was praising God and then he comes to Jesus and no longer does the separation and division cause him to keep his distance cubits upwind or downwind. He goes right up to Jesus and throws himself at the feet of Jesus of the man who through God's power had healed him and Dr. Luke tells us that he thanked Jesus. He came back and he thanked Jesus. Jesus. And then the surprise. Dr. Luke saves the bombshell to last. He includes and he says, and he was a Samaritan. This man was a Samaritan. This was a man from across the border. This was someone who was separated from Jesus by nationality, by religion, and by culture. This was a man who'd been separated from Jesus because he was unclean. In the world's eyes, there were so many reasons why Jesus should not have had any involvement with this man or even healed him. And yet, knowing exactly who he was, Jesus had crossed all the divides and he dealt with all that separated them physically. And this Samaritan was now healed and he'd come back to say thank you to Jesus. We have so much to thank God for, don't we? So many times Jesus sees you and I in our pitiful state, he hears our cries of mercy and he crosses the divides and he meets our needs. What a picture Dr. Luke paints for us this morning. We come to Jesus with our problems and Jesus sees us in that pitiful state and he tells us what to do. And if we are obedient and our prayer, our prayer will be answered and in gratitude, we praise God and we come and we throw ourselves at the feet of the one who has exercised God's power, Jesus and we say thank you. Or do we? Or do we? I wonder how many of those people who are praying and finish those interviews on television saying that they're praying to God actually recognise when God answers prayer and go back and thank him for it. It's gratitude and thanksgiving that prompted an old man to visit an old broken pier on the eastern sea coast of Florida. Every Friday night until his death in 1973, this man would return walking slowly and slightly stooped with a bucket full of shrimp. The seagulls flocked to this man and, and he would feed them from his bucket. 
The story goes, many years before, in October 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in a B-17 bomber to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour which hurled Captain Eddie into the most harrowing adventure of his life, along with the rest of the crew of that B-17 bomber. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the Flying Fortress became lost beyond the reach of radio. Fuel began to run low and the, and the crew together decided they were going to have to ditch the aircraft and go for the life, uh, go for the life rafts. For nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his companions would fight the water, they'd fight the weather and the scorching sun. They had many sleepless nights and, and they were recoiling against the giant sharks ramming against the rafts. The, the biggest raft was apparently nine and a half feet long by five and the, and the largest shark they saw was about ten feet long. So they were out, uh, you know, outgunned by the size of these things. So they got plenty of opposition as they floated around the sea. But of all the enemies that they had out there and as they floated around for that month, the most formidable was starvation. All the rations had gone or they'd been destroyed by seawater. And by day eight, he was starting to feel the effects. It was going to take a miracle to sustain them. And then a miracle occurred. Cherry, that was the B-17 Captain William Cherry, this is the words of Captain Eddie now, read the service that afternoon. And we finished with a prayer of deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat, with my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off. Something landed on my head. I knew that it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew, I just knew. Everyone else knew too. No one said a word. But peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at the gull. And the gull meant food, if I could catch it. Well, as we say, the rest is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull, its flesh was eaten, and its intestines were used to fish, for bait for fish. The survivors were sustained, and their hopes renewed, because a lone seagull, uncharacteristically a long way on its own, away from home, landed on this guy's head. It offered itself, as it were, as a sacrifice. Captain Eddie, as we know, of course, made it because there he was telling the tale. And we now also know that he never forgot. And he was also always thankful. Because every Friday evening, about sunset, on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast, you could see an old man slightly bent with white bushy hair and bushy eyebrows, slightly bent, carrying his bucket of shrimp to feed the gulls. To remember that one, on a day long before, who gave itself without a struggle. How often do we thank God for what he's done for us? For the sacrifice that he made in sending Jesus? How often do we give thanks to God for that sacrifice that he made? How often do we return and throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus, the one who saved us and thank him? The one who, on a day long past, gave himself without a struggle. Well, Jesus had some questions, didn't he? There was only one had returned, and he had three questions. He said, we're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? So what did happen to the other nine? What happened to the other nine who didn't return? Well, first of all, we can surmise that some of them were Jews, because that seemed to be where he was sending to, to the priest. All nine may have been Jews, but there was certainly one Samaritan, we know that. And it may have been that the misery of the disease had bound the Jews and the Samaritans together. They were in border country, they all had leprosy, they couldn't be with their families, they might as well be together. We don't know. But we do know that they all walked off, and they all got healed. Jesus sent them off to the priest, and there's nothing to suggest that there was only one healed. They were all healed. So the question we need to ask is, did they go to the priests uh, as atheists, as if they were going through the motions, that they'd been healed and they needed to complete the ritual of the law? Or, or did they go there as good Orthodox Jews, praising God along the way and thanking him for, for all that he'd done? We don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus is not happy with either of those responses. Neither of those responses was acceptable to Jesus. You see, Jesus wanted more than general thank for vague thankfulness. The powerful work of God had been manifested through Jesus. And the expectation from Jesus was that all ten would return to him. 
You know, it's bad enough, isn't it, when people fail to thank God for the blessings that are evident around us in the world today. But this was even more sad than that, more critical than that, more serious than that. You see, this miracle had happened, and the real point of it was that those who had been healed were to see what was obvious, that this was the work of the Saviour. This was the work of the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and, and his purpose was to point them to Jesus because it, the, the miracle was going to be greater than just their healing. This was about them returning in faith to Jesus and receiving through faith salvation and eternal life. You see, they'd accepted the physical healing and maybe they rushed off to the priest and to the family. Who can blame them? They could have been 20 years without them and they separated and got on with their life and didn't think to go back to Jesus. But the problem was this was all temporary. Their bodies would get ill and decay again. What mattered was salvation, forgiveness and eternal life. Salvation, eternal life and the kingdom of God had come within their reach. But their thankfulness for their physical healing didn't extend to anything beyond that. They walked away. And as far as we know, they never came back to Jesus. They walked away and as they did, that separation, that division got longer and longer with every footstep they took away from Jesus and they missed out. They missed out on the real blessing. By contrast, the Samaritan, well, he'd been healed. He comes back and Jesus says to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Well, these words indicate something more than him just being made physically well. This is a, a phrase which means he was forgiven. He was restored. He'd become a Christian. This was something different than had been said to the other nine. All ten had been healed physically. This was something special for this guy who'd come back. This man who'd been separated from Jesus on so many levels returned and gave thanks. And as he did so, Jesus forgave his sin and he was completely restored to God through Jesus. All barriers gone, all separation disappeared, a man unclean from the other side of the border healed, restored forgiven he had so much to thank God for and so do you and I you see those who come to Jesus in faith and thanksgiving always go away with so much more than they could ever have hoped or imagined but all of God's gifts are meant to lead us in thankfulness to Jesus it's why even with war in Ukraine and sanctions in Russia when the world is in a mess and our health is not what we want it to be. When life seems to be unfair, when the gas and electricity bills are going up, that we can still be thankful to God. Because whatever else is going on in the world, or in our lives, we have so much to thank God for. And not just the many blessings we do have in this life, but for our salvation, our forgiveness, and for the certain hope of eternal life. You see, this whole of this journey with Jesus that we are on, every step as we accompany him is taking us towards Jerusalem. And Jesus knows that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to die on a cross in order to save Peter Gleave and to save you and anybody else that's prepared to come to him in faith, repenting of their sin and wanting to follow Jesus. And knowing all that, he goes on step by step towards the cross at Jerusalem. He keeps on journeying all the way, knowing why he's doing it. At Aim Church, we want others to see and know Jesus, don't we? We all want other people to come here. We want to see this kingdom of God's being built. So we each need to live our lives of thankfulness. So that in the midst of the horror and the pain and the injustice of this world, that others will see us face down at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks. Thanking him for all that he has done and continue to do. And that we will, of course, in that way, set the example and raise their curiosity as to who this Jesus is. The story is told in Germany that uh, about the Thirty Years' War it raised in the 1600s. It was a terrible war that resulted in the death of over 20% of the German population. And it affected Europe too. Making it one of the most destructive human conflicts in history. Millions died, decimating Germany and causing plague and famine. It ravaged the entire region. The walled city of Elenburg became the refuge for political and military figures. 
But the result there was overcrowding, and of course when you got overcrowding there was pestilence, and there was famine, and then the armies that came, they overran the city three times, and Pastor Martin Rinkart did everything he could to show the love of God to the refugees which kept flooding through the city walls. His home was a shelter for the victims, even though he was often hard-pressed hard to provide for his own family. During the height of all this, there was a severe plague in, in 1637, and Rinkart was the only surviving pastor in the entire area. He performed in that year 4,000-plus funerals. On occasions, he was doing 50 funerals a day, including that of his own wife. At last, in 1637, only Martin Rinkart, of all the Christian leaders, was left. And it was a time of great despair and discouragement. But the Germans looked to Pastor Rinkart as their leader. And people were amazed that he never fell ill, even when ministering to so many sick families and refugees. God was protecting him for such a time because the Swedes came once again and they surrounded the city and they demanded a ransom equivalent to about $30,000. This is back then. And he had to go out. Martin Rickart was the only one who rose to the challenge. He left the safety of the city walls to walk outside and to negotiate with the enemy. And he went to ask the Swedish general for mercy for the people, and he refused. So turning back towards the people, this is what Martin Rinkart said. Come, my children, we can find no hearing, no mercy with men. Let us take refuge with God. And there and then he got on his knees and he began to pray. And his prayer was so heartfelt and so powerful, and God heard and answered it, that the general relented. And for 2,000 florins, the ransom was paid, and the war finally began to ease and the conditions slowly subsided out of awful and started to improve. And out of this experience, Pastor Rinkart wrote a hymn. Some people think he'd already written it as a grace at the time for his family to use, but this is the hymn which was written at that time. There's not a hint of woe is me in the words, just grace and gratitude and thankfulness from a man who went through so much. These are the words. Now thank we all our God, with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Oh, may this bounteous God through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us in his grace and guide us when perplexed and free us from all ills in this world and the next. All praise and thanks to God the Father now be given, the Son and whom he reigns with them in highest heaven, the one eternal God whom earth and heaven adore, for thus it was, is now, and shall be evermore. So as we journey with Jesus in a life of thankfulness, let us demonstrate that thankfulness as we live out our lives. And this morning you and I know that this world is a challenging place, isn't it? Men and women and boys and girls are suffering dreadfully. Let us be like Martin Rinkart, who was able to do all that he did and still be thankful to God in the midst of those horrendous circumstances. Aim Church wants to offer help and hospitality to refugees. We want to cross all the divides of separation, of nationality, of religion, of health and problems. And this is going to need to be a whole church effort. We're going to need to open our homes to refugees. We're going to need to support those who are able to open their homes and to the families and the people who come here. It's going to mean that we as a church have to sacrifice. We may have to do things that we don't want to do. It might be costly, but it will be costly physically, emotionally, financially, and even spiritually. But in thankfulness to God for all that he's done for us, we can do this for him together as a sign of our thankfulness. On Wednesday, some of them were sharing the U version of the Bible gives you a daily verse. And on Wednesday, I was praying about all this, and the verse for the day was contained in these three verses in 1 John 3, verse 16 to 18, which says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, 
but with actions and in truth. Friends, if we're going to be like that one leper who returned, we know Jesus as our saviour. We realise that the journey he went on, he did so for us. We also know that you and I are unclean, separated from God, and it was the love of Jesus, sacrificing himself, that saved us. And now, right now, we have the chance to show our thankfulness and show the love of Jesus to others. Let's not miss out like the nine who took the temporary blessing of physical healing and missed out on the eternal blessing that Jesus had intended for them. So church, let us be thankful. Let us be thankful to him by being like him, by being like Jesus. Let us show his love and our thankfulness. Many of you have already contacted me to say what you can do. And I trust that you might be able to continue to think about it if you've not already done that. Please also let me know. Contact me today. Come and talk to us. Because this has to be a whole church thing. We've got to work together on this. And, and I want to know what you are prepared to do for these people. Tomorrow the scheme opens and we can start to apply. We need to know today whether you're in or whether you're not. Next week on our journey with Jesus, we're approaching Jericho. And we'll be looking at how we need to be persistent in our faith. Until then, let's live a life of thankfulness whatever comes our way this week. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Father, we, your church, here in Appleton, we want to serve you. We want to say thank you to you. So we each come this morning, bound together by the love of Jesus, to thank and praise you for the love which you have shown to us, Thank you that Jesus died in our place on a cross at Calvary. Thank you that he shed his blood that we might go free. Father, we know that we are sinners saved by grace. And we want to find new ways of showing our thankfulness to you and expression of our worship by serving you in the world today and showing others by being like Pastor Rinkart and getting on our knees and asking for your help and praising you and showing the world what you can do. Father, help us this week. Help us not to be found wanting. Help us not to be like the nine who, who took the temporary blessing and disappeared. But Lord, let us be like the one who returned, who crossed all the divides, who committed his way to Jesus and Jesus blessed him. Help us, Lord, to go from this place today, united as a church, to help each other, to show our love for each other and your love to each other, that we might be a community that is loving and kind and caring and welcoming. That, Father, we might be prepared for all that's ahead of us, the difficult days which we're going to encounter. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who welcome refugees, who, Lord, give them the hope, give them the care that you gave to us. Lord, we pray that this church might be a shining light, a beacon for you in this country. That, Father, we might do our bit and beyond to help these people. And through it, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified and you'd accept it as part of our gift of our praise and our thankfulness for what you have done for us. These things we ask in your name. Amen.